Today I'm gonna to show you how to take a shot that looks like this to something that looks like this. So grab a cocktail or a soda pop and let's settle in because you're about to learn something. Lighting is arguably the most important thing when it comes to the visuals of movie making. I mean, without light, it would look like this. There would be no movie. It is literally how your movie or video looks. Lighting, not the camera, will be the number one visually defining thing that tells the audience whether or not your creative piece of media is awe-inspiring and professional, or an amateur thrown together embarrassment. The planes are in the Ultimately, the basic goal of professional lighting is to focus the attention on the subject with context that helps tell the story but doesn't distract. So now that we've established how important it is and what it's supposed to be doing, let's start with the four types of lights. Tungsten. These are the same lights we grew up with before LEDs and the same type of lights Hollywood has used for the majority of its history. Also known as incandescent, Tungsten lights pros are that they're cheap. They don't flicker at high frame rates and their color temperature, also known as Kelvin, is very accurate, but more on that later. The downside to tungsten lights are that they get very hot and will make the set you're on very hot and your actors and film crew very hot. The fixtures are heavy and they require fans to keep them cool, which can also cause issues when recording sound in the same space. But fear not, there are a few more types of lights. HMI which stands for hydrargyromedium arc iodide. Hydrargyrum, 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 hydrargyrum. Hydrargyrum medium arc iodide. I don't know if I'm saying that right. Still used today in all productions due to the insane amount of light they put out, these lights are often used through windows from outside. HMI lights are two to three times more powerful to equal wattage tungsten lights, and sometimes they're the only light that will get you what you want for the shot when you need to mimic the inside. Unfortunately, they're also extremely big, heavy, skin melting hot, expensive, and require big ballast boxes. So they're the choice when you need an insane amount of light and aren't used for much of anything else. Believe it or not, fluorescent lights are used for video and film production still. And there are some reasons for this. They're very cheap, they're lightweight, they require very little power, and they're much cooler and give off a much softer light without diffusion. More on diffusion in a bit as well. Unfortunately, they're also very delicate tend to be housed in fixtures that are quite large and can have lots of issues with flickering in your shots, especially at high frame rates. Lastly, there are LED lights, which stands for light emitting diode. As the new kid on the block, they are the latest craze. However, LEDs do have their downsides too. Namely, they can also suffer from flickering in your footage, especially at higher frame rates, and they can be quite expensive. They also just can't put out as much light as an HMI light. However, the reason LEDs have become so popular for video and film production these days is because they're extremely efficient, produce very low heat, and are very portable, and they can fit in tight little spaces. Also, many RGB LEDs can emit all the colors of the rainbow, as well as dial in the exact Kelvin temperature that you need. Which brings us to the next topic of lighting. Kelvin. What the f is that? Why, why do you keep calling me Kelvin? That is your name, isn't it? It's written all over your underwear. It's not a what, but a who. Lord Kelvin invented the Kelvin scale to measure light temperature from very warm, 1000 Kelvin, to very cool, 9000 Kelvin. We're talking about the actual color of natural light from candlelight, which is very orange, to moonlight, which is very blue. In between is daylight at roughly 5000 Kelvin. And this is generally considered white for all intents and purposes. In between these three Kelvin numbers, are man-made lights and outdoor light on cloudy days. So why does this matter? White balance. Have you ever taken a photo indoors at night with the lights on and thought, why is everything so orange? That's because the white balance in the camera or phone is set incorrectly. Cameras are stupid. You need to tell them what color is white. One way to do this is to dial in the Kelvin number. Household tungsten incandescent lights are around 3,500 Kelvin. If you have other lights in the room that are not incandescent, say cool white fluorescent lights, then you now have more than one version of what is considered white in your shot. This can be a real problem if that's not what you want. To fix this, you have to make sure all your lights are emitting roughly the same Kelvin number. For example, if you want all the lights in your shot to look white, then you set all the lights to 3500K in the scene 
and you set your camera's white balance to 3500K. Et voila, all colors look correct. Next is brightness. I promise this will be quick. Contrary to popular belief, wattage refers to the power consumption, not how bright a light is. But lumen is the amount of light coming from the light, and lux is the measurement of that light on a one square meter surface. Got it? No? Well, sorry, we're moving on. All you really need to know for this basic 101 video is that you should be looking at lumens and lux when deciding on which lights to buy or use in a shot for your needs in order to gauge the brightness. Number four, shaping light, texture, and shadows. So now you have some lights. Now what? Think of light and shadows like yin and yang. You can't have one without the other, and both are of equal importance to be able to control the look of your film or video. So let's look at some ways to control both. Barn doors are used to shape the light, to make it wide and bounce all over, or to be focused. Cutters, flags, and scrims are used to either block light where you don't want it, or cut down on the amount of light in a given area. This is what we call shaping light. Diffusion, or diffusers, allow us to control the amount of light. The more diffusion, the softer the light and shadows. Each time light has to pass through or bounce off a material, it is diffused even more and made more softer. More on that later. Gobos. These are essentially panels with shapes cut out of them and placed in front of lights to give specific patterns to the shadows that are cast from the lights. Things like window blinds, window frames, and tree branches can be inferred by using gobos over your lights. Texture and atmosphere. It's everywhere in movies and you probably never even realized it. Here it is, here it is, and here, and here, and here, and you get the idea. Texture and atmosphere is essentially dust or fog in the air. It's added for a few reasons. It can set the mood, it can set the era, help separate the subject from the background, or help to focus your attention on something in the shot. If you never noticed this before, you won't be able to not notice it now. This effect is created by hazing machines, special aerosol sprays, or even foggers with non-toxic material in them and the lights that interact with those particles. <sighs> okay, now let's start putting all this knowledge to work in a shot. Three-point lighting. Probably the most common lighting technique for talking heads is the three-point lighting technique. Basically, it calls for three lights. Duh. The key light, the fill light, and the backlight. To simplify it, the key light is your main light. The fill light fills in and softens the shadows from the key. And the backlight is used behind the subject to separate them from the background. The most common position for the key light is shining from the side of the face and maybe even elevated a bit. It's also known as Rembrandt lighting, named after the famous artist who lit his subjects like this most of the time. You'll know when you have it right when you see a triangle on the opposite side of the cheek to the side that the light is on. You can use either a second fill light for the shadow side or even a bounce card or light surface to bounce the key light off of to reflect back onto the shadow side. Keep in mind though that this surface needs to be pretty close to the subject but just out of view of the shot to work. Next, you position a backlight to illuminate the head and shoulders of the subject. So there's a line of light along the edge of them that separates them from the background. That's it. But of course, there's a lot more things you can do to improve the shot. Namely, diffusion and cove lighting. At this point, your lighting might look too harsh and unflattering for the subject. There might be times when this is the look you want, but usually a softer kind of light and shadows is called for. This will smooth out the skin and soften the features of your subject. That's when you need diffusion. By adding a whiter colored thin fabric between the light and your subject, the harsh shadows and hot spots can be reduced. The more layers of fabric, the softer the light, but also the weaker the light. One of Hollywood's greatest cinematographers, Roger Deakins, who has made some of the most iconic films of the last 30 years, swears by a technique called cove lighting. This gives off a very natural style of lighting that allows for more movement of the actors and cinematographer in the scene. It works like this, a large piece of unbleached muslin, similar to the kind of off-white fabric that painters lay down, is stretched around the actor with stands. Lights that are set in varying degrees from high to low are then placed along the sheet and bounced off the muslin and onto the actor's face. This creates a very subtle but natural look that is very flattering to the actor and also allows for more movement for the cinematographer. Depth, interest, and environment. The background behind the subject is also not to be forgotten. Give your scene more depth by adding space between your subject and the background. Adding additional lights and colors will add interest and create a more three-dimensional look to your shot so your subject pops out. You don't want your background to be so interesting that it distracts from the subject matter, though. 
Motivated lighting. Simply put, motivated lighting is about lighting your scene and subject as though the actual lights in the scene, also known as practicals, are the ones doing all the work, when in actuality, it's the out-of-the-shots lights that are doing the heavy lifting. For example, the Pop Art Films LED sign that's behind me looks like it's lighting up this side of my face. But actually, it's an LED light that's lighting up this side of my face. Your brain says, sure, that looks right. Same goes for something like a fireplace casting light on a subject, or moonlight through a window. These subtle light effects are often faked by light just off screen or hidden from sight. A catch light. This one's very simple. A catch light is the tiny bit of light seen in the subject's eyes. This may seem unimportant, but without it, the subject looks ominous, dead even. Hold it there. And just get her up, man. So unless that's what you're going for, you're going to want a catch light in your actor's eyes. So those are the very basics of lighting. Of course, there's so much more that I didn't cover, but I'm trying to keep these videos to a length that's tolerable. If you'd like to learn more about lighting techniques, let me know in the comments section and don't forget to like and subscribe. See you in the next video where we learn about the 10 best tips for script writing. Ciao.